I'm pleased to welcome as our guests today, Ben Bland from the Lowy Institute, joining us today from Sydney, Australia, and Sir Richard Gosney, also overseas, but rather closer in the Isle of Man. And they are with us today to talk about Indonesia and particularly about Joko Widodo. Indonesia gets less attention in the UK than many other countries in Southeast Asia, perhaps because in this country and indeed in this society, we have a tendency to focus on parts of the world with which the UK once had a colonial relationship. Indonesia is the biggest country in Southeast Asia in terms of economy and land mass, has the largest Muslim population in the world, is the world's fourth most populous nation and its 10th largest economy in terms of purchasing power parity. These facts tend not to be well known, but they are among the things that make Indonesia important to the rest of the world. And for the same reasons, who governs Indonesia and how matter too. In 2017, the election of Joko Widodo as president of Indonesia was a departure from the country's history in many ways. Jokowi, as he is known, is the first national political leader in Indonesia not to have come from a traditionally powerful elite. And as you will hear, he has surprised in many other ways too, in his time as mayor of Surakarta and governor of Jakarta, as well as in his presidential role. Ben Bland is the director of the Southeast Asia program at the Lowy Institute and was previously a journalist for the Financial Times in Hanoi, Hong Kong and Jakarta. In 2020, he published a short study of Jokowi, Man of Contradictions, Joko Widodo and the Struggle to Remake Indonesia. You will shortly find a link to it in the chat channel. Uh, Sir Richard Gosney is now the Lieutenant Governor of the Isle of Man, and I have to thank him for rescheduling an appointment with primary school children to open a new nature trail in order to be with us this afternoon. Richard was the UK ambassador to Indonesia from 2000 to 2004 and subsequently High Commissioner to Nigeria and Governor of Bermuda. And I had the pleasure of working with and for Richard on a number of occasions through our FCO careers. It's a pleasure to welcome both our speakers. If you have questions that you would like to put to Ben or Richard or both, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and I will now hand over to them. Richard. Uh, thank you, Michael, and thank you for the invitation uh, to talk a, a little about an intriguing man um, from a country which has always intrigued me. I lived there 20 years ago. I had lived there 45 years ago as a young diplomat as well. Um, uh, ben Bland, Ben, you uh, put, write a sympathetic picture of an Indonesian president, mayor of Solo, governor of Jakarta, then Indonesian president, uh, different from others. He has um, a common touch and a very practical bent. And he's got important achievements to his credit as your book brings out. But some observers have said that they're disappointed. My first question to you is, do you think the expectations of this different sort of Indonesian politician as a president were always going to be inflated, were always going to be greater than anyone in that sort of position could deliver? I think, uh, before you answer that, I think uh, some comparison with Gus Dur, the first democratically elected president of Indonesia just over 20 years ago, the first, he, he was the first since the 1950s, expectations of him were certainly inflated. But what's your view on this in the case of Jokowi? Thank you. Well, thanks for the question, Richard, and thank you, Michael and the, the RSAA for having me uh, on this virtual um, seminar today. It's, it's great to, to be with you and to have a chance to talk about a country that, that I, I love very much. I've spent a lot of time there. And it's true that not enough people know about Indonesia, not just uh, in the UK, but in Australia, where I am in, in the US, as Kurt Campbell, uh, the new uh, Asia Pacific czar for President Biden uh, told me, there's no monopoly on ignorance about Indonesia. So hopefully I can help and we can help in our little way to correct some of that today. So back to your question, Richard, I mean, I think, I'm a football fan, and, and this, this question makes you think of football because without hope, there is no disappointment. And I think the, the inverse is true as well, that if you have great hopes uh, for your team, or in this case, for your leader, it's inevitably going to soon be washed up on the, the inevitable rocks of, of disappointment um, that we find in, in politics and in our daily lives. So 
Jokowi, uh, for those who aren't familiar with him, Joko Widodo is his full name. Jokowi is the nickname by which he's known universally. And, and that name actually came from the days when he was a furniture salesman uh, traveling Europe, trying to sell the wooden furniture that he made in a small factory. And a French client of his said, how can I differentiate you from all the other Indonesians called Joko, which is a very common given name in, in, in Indonesia. So they came up with this nickname, Jokowi. Uh, but anyway, so his, his background was as a furniture salesman, then mayor of, of Surakarta or Solo, his hometown. And, and just he went in two years from being mayor of this small city of 500,000 people to being president of a nation of 270 million people. And I guess he was the embodiment of the outsider. He didn't come from an elite background. He talks uh, and, and looks in a way like the average Indonesian. And he reflected kind of popular hopes for cleaner government, a stronger economy, better education and health services for the poor. But as I started, whenever ho that hopes like that are so high, you're always going to struggle to live up to them because politics is always this mix of, of personality, of, of leadership, of these deeper structural forces, and then a certain degree of chance. And it's very hard for one person to change the, these deep structural forces. So like Gustor, uh, who you mentioned earlier, Abdurrahman Wahid, uh, one of the early post Sahato uh, presidents, I think it was inevitable that Jacobi was gonna struggle to live up to these great expectations, partly because of his own limitations, but also because, and I think it's there in the subtitle of my book, the struggle to remake Indonesia, the challenge of trying to reform this country that's so big, so diverse, spread over thousands of different islands with hundreds of different religious and ethnic groups and a country that's very young, uh, really only won its independence in the aftermath of the Second World War uh, from, from the Dutch, of course, and really had never been a country before, had been a collection of different peoples. And uh, colonialism both kind of suppressed the Indonesian people, took away their resources, but ironically at the same time in throwing off the shackles, it forged the Indonesian nation. But I think that nation building project is still very much a work in progress 75 plus years down the line. Uh, thank you very much. That sort of sets the scene quite nicely, I think. My second question to you is about um, President Jokowi's mix of Javanese culture with which he grew up and where he had his business and uh, the political culture into which he's had fitted and had to work. The Javanese, especially those from central Java where he came, comes from, as did Suharto importantly, have a reputation and a very strong reputation for patience, balance, equanimity, and avoiding confrontation. Uh, and in avoiding difficult decisions or in challenging people with vested interests, which President Jokowi has done, uh, it's been noted, in, and your book does the same, a, a fairly recent president, Bambang Yudhoyono, uh, had did something of the same uh, and came from the, from the same uh, cultural background in a way. But how much uh, does, uh, Jokowi's avoidance of confrontation uh, and challenging people reflect his Javanese culture and how much is it just him having to live with the, the real politic of uh, Indonesia where there are an awful lot of big vested interests? It's, it's a really good question um, Richard because I, I think because Indonesia is such a fascinating place and has many different cultures but obviously the dominant one is the Javanese culture that's where the majority of the population live on the island of, of Java, uh, perhaps the most densely populated island in the world. Um, and it's the dominant culture in Indonesian politics as well. Um, so people have always been fascinated by it. And anthropologists, of course, in particular, love Indonesia because of its many cultural quirks. And there are obviously many unique things about Javanese culture and Indonesian culture uh, more broadly. But I'm always wary as someone who studied history of any um, kind of single view of, of a country or an issue. I'm wary of any overly simplistic, essentialist explanation, if you like. And I think there's always a risk of that with Javanese culture of trying to explain everything in Indonesia through that lens. But I do think there's a lot that is essentially Javanese about Jokowi, about the way he doesn't like direct conflict. Um, he often kind of explains away problems with traditional sayings in a way as you alluded to, like Suharto, this former general who ruled Indonesia in a very authoritarian, uh, some would say dictatorial manner for, for 32 years. Um, so, so there is that element to it. And we see that in how Jokowi structures 
um, his approach to politics. So he's built, if you like, this very big tent cabinet. So something like 75% uh, of those in the Indonesian parliament, the parties there, now have representatives in the Indonesian cabinet. And Jokowi fought two quite intense, heated presidential election campaigns against his main rival, Prabowo Subianto, a former special forces general with a, a track record of human rights abuses, but also uh, someone who's very well spoken and very ambitious and a strong nationalist. So there are these two bitterly fought elections. But after that, in 2019, after Jokowi's second election victory, he actually brought Prabowo into his cabinet as defense minister. And then more recently, he brought Prabowo's former vice presidential candidate into his cabinet as well. So now you have this curious position where Jokowi's rivals are in the cabinet, his friends are in the cabinet, everyone is, has a representative, if you like, in the cabinet. And it, it looks quite curious on the one hand to outsiders, how are you going to get anything done if you want to achieve this kind of harmony and consensus and every force in society and politics somehow has a voice at the table? How can you push ahead with your key reforms, which for Jokowi are about opening up the economy? So I think that has been a challenge. It's partly culture, but I think it's partly the way politics is done in Indonesia and a reflection of his desire um, to kind of keep these forces together rather than having them pulling apart the country. So I think it's a bit of culture, it's a bit of real politique, and it's a bit of Jokowi's personality as well. But certainly there have been times in his, his time in office uh, where he has fired people, which is something very un-Javanese because he's fallen out with them or they've upset him or they haven't lived up to his expectations. So I don't think we can explain everything through that cultural lens, but it is an important part of the picture of understanding the man and Indonesian politics more generally, because every president so far um, has come through that Javanese um, background. Thank you. That leads me on to a sort of subset of that question, if I may. Um, and you've, as you've just said, all the presidents are, are, have been Javanese, and most of us find it quite difficult to imagine the Indonesians as a whole electing a non-Javanese for the number one role. But the number two role at times can be important, and it has been repeatedly taken by much um, by people of rather different cultures from the Javanese. The Sumatrans, whether they're West Sumatrans or whether they're North Sumatrans, are feistier. And the people from Sulawesi, especially Southern Sulawesi, Southern Celebes, as we used to call it in in, in Britain, um, are also have a reputation, the Bugis people being very feisty. And you think way back to Sukarno, he had Mohammed Hatta for a num number of years, uh, uh, Sumatran. Uh, Suhata himself, he was someone like Adam Malik, another Sumatran as his deputy in his counterbalance. And when you came through to what goes to was such an atypical uh, Javanese, he didn't need a counterbalance uh, at all in lots of ways. But Megawati did and used Yusuf Kala, I think, a bit, and certainly Ambang Yudhiyono used Yusuf Kala more, and, and uh, um, Jokowi himself used Yusuf Kala. And now he doesn't have a, uh, an outer islander, if you like, as his vice president, but he has a very feisty general, Lohut, uh, um, a, a former special forces commander, um, a strong minded business and, and the rest of it, someone whom I, I know and, and respect. He's got Lohut there. How important is it, the, the counterbalance uh, given to what is quintessentially a role for Javanese with a counterbalance from those other islands, which are much bigger, have sizable populations, but are never likely to hold the top slot? Well, I think it's, it has been important in Indonesian politics, partly because of those kind of um, character questions that you raise there, that it, it certainly seems to be the case that people from other parts of Indonesia, particularly yeah, the Bataks from North Sumatra, the Bugis from South Sulawesi, historically have that, that more outspoken approach to things. So it seems to be a good foil in personality terms. But I think it's also important in, uh, from the perspective of keeping Indonesia together. I mean, ever since Indonesia's founding it, the country has faced a series of insurgencies, separatist movements, a really a challenge to how do you keep this, this very diverse country, which didn't exist before uh, in, in any real sense, together. Um, and one way is to represent different parts of, of the population. And so there does need to be this balance between Java, which is the population center, probably the cultural center in many ways, and the economic center with, with the outer islands, which you know, have kind of key economic resources, they obviously have a smaller proportion of the people, um, but it's important to reflect their views and their wishes in government. So I think that that's part of it. 
And I think a third aspect is Jokowi's own personality. So in every political job he's had as, as mayor of, of Solo, as governor of Jakarta and president of Indonesia, he's always worked with very different characters around him who've, who've kind of been a good foil to him. So actually the reason he became mayor of, of Solo, of Surakarta, his home city, was because PDIP, you know, the, the dominant party there, um, had a candidate who happened to be a Christian. And Solo, like most of Java, is predominantly uh, Muslim. Um, and so they needed really a Muslim to be the top man. And they brought in Jokowi. The idea was that the guy beneath him, FX Rudy, uh, would be the kind of real power center. And Jokowi would be a kind of Islamic or Muslim shield around that. But in the end, um, they worked very well together. And Rudy was a much more kind of confrontational guy who, who really got things done. Jokowi was more out there keeping relations good with all different sectors of society. And then we saw something similar in Jakarta where uh, Jokowi actually worked with an ethnic Chinese Christian, uh, Ahok, as he was known, um, a double minority in Indonesia who was kind of much more arrogant, confrontational. Again, he was quite a good foil. And now Jokowi had use of color in his first term for various complicated reasons. Jokowi's vice president now is an aging Islamic cleric who doesn't really do anything, uh, but he's there to kind of neutralize criticism of Jokowi on religious grounds. But Luhut Panjaitan, who you mentioned, he's more like a kind of de facto vice president. And again, he represents that more kind of gung-ho, all action um, figure to be a foil to Jokowi's kind of smoother way of doing things. So I think it's partly his personality, it's partly kind of these cultural mixes in Indonesia, and it's partly about the need to have a balance in the Indonesian policy between Java and the outer islands if the country is to keep together. And I think the other element for Jokowi here uh, that's important to understand is infrastructure, which has been his main push really in his first term and in uh, his second term before COVID hit. And I think he sees that as a way to kind of embody connecting the outer islands to Java through building airports, ports, toll roads, uh, rail lines. So he's really tried to kind of fill out this vision for an Indonesia that really is a connected unitary state. Uh, and that's, that's, that's no mean feat. He's made a decent amount of progress there. But those tensions, I think, will always remain in Indonesia simply because of the size and scale. I mean, from, from Papua to Aceh, east to west in Indonesia is something like, you know, the distance from Los Angeles to, to New York City, but over the world's biggest archipelagic state with something like 7,000 occupied islands. Thank you very much. Um, that uh, focus, which again, you bring out well in your book of President Jokowi on infrastructure leads me on to my next question, which is about his economic focus. I mean, he's got political now, so there's no doubt about that and good political now and tremendous uh, eye for a good camera shot as well. I remember about 10 years ago, I visited Jakarta uh, at the same time as Boris Johnson. They were each, mayors of their capital cities. And there was a wonderful photograph took the front page of the newspaper, both of them cycling around. Jakarta in some ways, for those who don't know it, hasn't got a center, but if it had a center, there would be a roundabout in front of, it would be the roundabout in front of the hotel in Indonesia. And there were the two mayors cycling around, being photographed and filmed by everyone around the roundabout. That was a, that was a wonderful political coup. Uh, but his focus is economic. And in that sense, um, uh, I, rather assume from what I'd heard and certainly much reinforced by your book, that if there was a choice between economic progress in specific areas, whether it's infrastructure or whether it's education or health and um, paying service to some of the finer points of human rights or some of the major points of human rights concerns, uh, Jokowi's instinct would be to go for the infrastructure, to go for the new clinic, go for the new school, go for the new bridge or toll road, is that right? Yeah, I think that that's exactly right. His instincts are economic. And we have to remember where he came from in two important ways. I mean, firstly, you know, his, his youth and his experiences as a young man uh, working in as a plantation work, plantation manager on, on a forestry plantation and then running his own furniture factory. But that was all in the Suharto era. So his experiences, I think, were framed uh, under a government that also put economic development above all things. And I think Jokowi's worldview in as much as he has one, because he's not a guy who reads political biographies or thinks about how politics works. 
was framed by his experience of building his own business. So he really has this kind of nuts and bolts approach to the economy. Um, and that's that's what makes him tick. That's what he wants to to progress. And I think he's not interested um, in human rights, particularly, although when he came to power, he did tap into kind of support from a lot of human rights groups who saw him as an outsider, who thought he would be a good vehicle for kind of deeper political change in Indonesia. And he did kind of pay lip service to some of some of their uh, wishes. And I think he kind of used them in, in a sense to advance his own interests. But he was never really interested in those issues. And I think he's become more explicit, the more confident he's got in the presidential palace. He's you know, in the last few years, he's explicitly talked about Indonesia's democracy having gone too far. You know, it's getting in the way of getting things done. So he's explicitly rolled back the powers of Indonesia's formerly very powerful independent anti-corruption commission, which I think was one of the great success stories of the reformasi, the reform period after the ouster of Suharto. So he's rolled that back because he thought it's getting in the way. Uh, it's stopping civil servants from having the confidence to get projects done. Um, and I think it's not just that, but more generally, we've seen a bit of a crackdown on critics of Jokowi across society, journalists, activists and the like. And I think he's talked about Indonesian people wanting to see economic development above all else. And there are some surveys that show that's the case, that the Indonesians view democracy above all as being a tool to drive economic development. But I still think people care about the freedoms they have now that they didn't have in the Suharto era. So there is a bit of a risk that he could go too far with that. And an example is there's been a lot of talk recently. There's officially a two term limit in Indonesia in the constitution. And there's been some talk of whether Jokowi might try to change the constitution to have a third term. And there's been a fair bit of pushback against that. Uh, and I think that there are limits to how far Indonesians kind of view economic development above other issues. And a lot of people still, older people particularly, remember kind of the bad old days and they want some sort of balance. They do want a better economy, better access to health and education, um, but they also don't want to lose the hard war, hard fought and hard won ability to, to criticize their government. So I think there does need to be a balance. And I'm not sure Jokowi's always got that balance right. And that's partly also about him and the people around him. So it's not just Luhut and Prabowo, but he surrounded himself with a number of former generals from the military, from the police, who I think have a very kind of security focused approach and they tend to not really see the difference between kind of loyal criticism and treachery uh, to their minds. It tends to all be the same thing because their experiences uh, were really all from the old, old New Order, Sahata era days. So I think that, that there's, there's a balance and I'm not sure Jacoby's got it quite right. And Indonesia still being a democracy with contested elections, you know, these are issues that will have to be fought out at, at the ballot box in future. Thank you. I think um, I, my sense uh, is that that uh, desire for some basic human rights amongst many people and go back to the, the people in the villages and towns and cities of, of Java is there and they are very thankful when they no longer get the high handed approach that sometimes happened in the Suharto days that if a, if a, if a, a slum needed to be cleared, it was cleared and, and questions were, were not entertained before it was cleared. And Jokowi has been good on that. When it comes to human rights in Indonesia, a lot of people, I think, or quite a group of people in uh, the outside world in, in Europe or in your, where you are down in uh, Australia, New Zealand, um, look at one particular area on human rights is Papua, the Indonesian half of the island of New Guinea. And down there, it's an area in which in some ways, when you're in Jakarta, it seems pretty peripheral. And I think to most Indonesians, it's pretty peripheral. It's got some important natural resources, an enormous uh, copper mine, which is also a good gold mine, and a gas field, and one or two other things. But it's, it's out beyond the edge of what most people know and think about. But uh, uh, the Papuans have for a long time, ever since they were incorporated in Indonesia, really, off and on, and they came into the Indonesia almost 20 years after the, the rest of the uh, of the islands. Uh, they have um, there been an independence movement down there, separatist movements down there, and usually through the what's well, certainly through Suharto years and and subsequently, it was the if you like the security apparatus, the security policy people who had the upper hand on uh, policy down there, suppressing the dissidents uh, uh, at least as much, if not more, than addressing the underlying causes of why the Papuans felt different and wanted to be treated 
somewhat lived differently. There were two ends of the country where this happened. One was Papua, the other was exactly the opposite end in northern tip of Sumatra in Aceh, where after the ghastliness of the tsunami and the big earthquake uh, producing tidal wave of, I think, 2007, uh, Jakarta swallowed hard and gave them a, a degree of autonomy, which they'd always said they would give no part of the country uh, because it was too dangerous a precedent. They did it up there, and Aceh has more or less been settled in political terms for much of the time since then. That's never happened in Papua. Jokowi himself is popular there. His own party has always been popular down there because it's been the PDI, Democratic Party of Indonesia, has been in many ways the, uh, the natural party for non-Muslims, they're mostly Christian over there, and for other and minorities, Chinese uh, and others. But one does see the news reports that are picked up, as they say, by um, human rights advocates in your part of the world and in Western Europe about the security apparatus being pretty firm down in Papua. Um, th is this something that uh, Chikowi has wanted to uh, take a different hand to, but found just too difficult or too time consuming? Or is it something that uh, it is part of a, an informal quid pro quo? You just let the security apparatus deal as, as they overwhelmingly as they think fit with something, which as I say, is in theory a threat to the uh, unity of the country because they actually think, say, claim that they want independence down there. I think this is one of the things that the many things that confounds me about Jokowi, which is why I talk about him as being a man of contradictions. But when he came to power as president in 2014, among the various sort of human rights questions that he did say he would address, he talked about having a different approach to Papua, um, more dialogue, listening to people. And I think there was quite a lot of hope that that would be genuine and that did help him become extremely popular. I think he win, he's won in both presidential elections, something like more than 90% of the vote um, in Papua, as he has done in many of the, the non-Muslim minority areas around Indonesia. So incredibly popular. And he did promise to bring this different approach. But in the end, he seems to have gone down a very similar path to Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono his, and other predecessors. Uh, which is on the one hand kind of securitization, uh, letting the, the generals and the police take charge, and on the other hand kind of driving um, infrastructure development and kind of top-down um, economic planning. So the idea being, you know, if you build enough roads, then the economy will improve, people will be better off economically, and so there'll be less disgruntlement and disquiet. And on the other hand, you go after the troublemakers and hit them hard. But of course, I think that misses the major gripe, well, not a gripe, the major problem that people have, which is to do with the history and how a lot of Papuans feel their voices weren't properly uh, heard and that the integration into Indonesia was forced on them, but also just the unequal treatment they feel they get both in Papua, where now you know the population is, is increasingly uh, Javanese and people from other parts of Indonesia, but also the treatment they get uh, when they go to university or travel or work around the rest of Indonesia, where they feel they're treated uh, like second class citizens because of their different skin color. And it's something that's very visible uh, to, to Indonesians. Um, so I think that those are really the, the concerns that people have. And he hasn't really addressed them at all. He's just gone down a very similar approach. I think partly he hasn't really spent the time to understand the problem in depth just because he's had many other issues to deal with. And as I said earlier, he's more of an instinctive politician. He doesn't really want to, to go in depth and have these long seminars with his advisors or read deeply into the history. I think it's also, as you're alluding to, Richard, a question of, you know, this is what this is a really sensitive issue for, for the military and for the police. And he didn't really want to go up against them when he came into power as an outsider. I think he feared he was in a weak position and he didn't really want to challenge these guys. So it's easier to let them do their own thing. But the result, I'm afraid, is that the problem has continued to fester. I mean, in the last few months, there's been a, a spike uh, there was a very senior Indonesian intelli intelligence officer who was killed. Uh, and then after that, you know, the Indonesian government promised to hit back hard, which is merely likely to kind of to extend the kind of cycle of, of violence and retribution. So it, it is a problem that always, unfortunately, threatens to undermine Indonesia's relations, uh, particularly with, with its Western partners, with Australia, the UK and the US, because there frankly are you know, human rights abuses that happen there. Um, and that's an issue that activists and politicians are rightly concerned about. And always, you know, it's, it's a small issue among the many issues Indonesia faces, 
but obviously it's a big one for the people who are affected. So I think it's unfortunate that Jacoby hasn't found a way to live up to the expectations there, but I guess it's not really surprising um, given the history. And the unfortunate thing is, um, you know, it kind of plays into the fears of, of the generals about foreign meddling in Indonesia in the sense that the Western powers always want to break up Indonesia, which I think dates back to the experience in Timor-Leste, but even more before that, you know, the Western meddling from, from the CIA, obviously supported uh, by their friends in, in, in the UK and Australia uh, during, you know, the Sukarno period and linked to Suharto's rise to power. So I think it plays into these deep-seated um, fears about Western intervention, which is unfortunate because in the end, you know, there does need to be some sort of broader dialogue to tackle these issues, or it's just going to be a very unhappy experience, not just for the people of Papua, but also it's going to undermine Indonesia's ability to move forward on other fronts, I think, as well. Uh, thank you. No, I, I don't disagree. I wouldn't disagree with any of that from what I know, though I haven't been to Papua for a good few years now. Uh, we ought, Ben, to move on, I think, to uh, some aspects of foreign policy, which we haven't really talked about explicitly. Foreign policy has always been an enigma in, in Indonesia ever since the very early days. Sukarno struck out on a limb. He founded, helped to found with Chu and Lai and others, the non-aligned movement with a great conference in Bandung, 50, 1955, uh, decades and decades ago, and, and then was um, chanced his arm in every sense by taking on Malaysia with confrontation, as well as taking a very forward uh, left-wing nationalist position uh, internationally. And uh, when he was deposed in 66, there was a long period of quiescence, if you like, in Indonesian foreign policy. Uh, for, for about 10 years, the country was putting itself together again, post Sukarno, and then East Timor happened and the Portuguese walked out and the Indonesians felt one way, rightly or wrongly, they had to walk in. And for the next 20 years, I think Indonesian foreign policy was uh, very much focused on limiting the damage internationally to their reputation for the fact that they'd walked in uh, to the old Portuguese territory and were running it rather against the wishes of quite a lot of the people uh, down there. They got rid of that in the late 90s, but no, and that's now over 20 years ago. But for that last 20 years, um, since um, uh, the interim president Habibi offloaded East Timor as an issue, um, it has is still much of the time been the sleeping giant in foreign policy. They have a, a, a mantra which is, is well known to all of us who've looked at the country about Indonesian policy being um, uh, uh, independent, non-aligned um, and the rest of it. But the, a lot of that has bo boiled down to not getting involved in outside uh, issues more than they, they had to. Even in their own uh, regional grouping, ASEAN, which was um, set up uh, really, or, or which took off after the fall of Vietnam with the sense that the Southeast Asian, other Southeast Asian nations had more in common uh, in defending themselves against the spread of communism. But even in ASEAN, they've been pretty, pretty cautious. My question to you is, is that finally changing under President Jokowi's leadership with a, a bridge to the old enemy of China, an old enemy because they were thought to be behind the Chinese Communist Party, um, which Suharto um, suppressed, stamped on very hardly, hard in 66. Is that changing now? Is there, both in the infrastructure projects and in other areas, uh, an arm being extended to China, which changes that, uh, uh, tilts the ba balance of that long-standing Indonesian reticence in foreign affairs? I'll get on to the, the China question in, in a second, but to address the, the first part of that, which is kind of how Indonesia sees foreign policy, I think we can't um, we can't overestimate how deep the, the scarring of uh, the Sukarno adventurism was. And we have to remember that how that ended, which was in 1965 and 66 and the years after, something like 500,000 to 2 million Indonesians of left-wing persuasion or suspected left leftists or people in the wrong place at the wrong time massacred. Um, as Suharto, as Suharto took power and tried to, as he viewed it, sort of cleanse Indonesia of leftist uh, elements that he viewed as being tied to Sukarno and allegedly tied to to the Chinese Communist Party or at least broader leftist and communist forces. And that was really a devastating massacre, a genocide um, that left deep scars in Indonesia. And I think there's been a sense ever since that the more engaged Indonesia becomes in external politics, 
the more the risks that has for do the domestic policy, for keeping Indonesia together. And I guess I'm an unusual foreign policy analyst and I'm not very interested in discussing constructivism and realism. I think almost all foreign policy is about domestic politics. And so I think in Indonesia, that what some people would view to be the lack of ambition is a result of not wanting to get involved in, in external entanglements that really tear apart uh, the seams of the Indonesian body politic. So uh, the Indonesians talk about their foreign policy being uh, bebas and active, independent and active. And I think the independence is really about non-alignment. Active is trying to be constructive, I guess, in the world. But in reality, I think they've been so concerned not to become involved in any difficult issues that it looks more, rather than independent and active, it looks more like passive and constrained uh, to me. But I think it's understandable for a developing country that has so many domestic issues, keeping the country together, trying to grow the economy, that you'll try and stay out of trouble. And Indonesia is lucky geographically being an archipelago at the southern end of the South China Sea. It doesn't share a land border with, with China, of course. It doesn't share much of an overlapping maritime claim either. So it tends to have been far away from external threats. Uh, so it's been able to, by and large, avoid those entanglements, which, which is good. I think things have changed a bit in the last few years, um, especially in, in the relationship with China. And I think that's broadly a reflection of Jokowi's focus on economic development and his pragmatism. So. Um, Jokowi, when he came in, talked about his foreign policy being about friends with benefits. Uh, so he said, what's the point in having all these diplomatic friends unless we get any benefits? Um, and he wants economic development. And it's really been China under Xi Jinping uh, that's been able to offer Indonesia kind of the most investment, uh, the most economic engagement with the fewest conditions, I think, in the short term. So we've really seen a flourishing of the trade uh, and the investment relationship in the last few years. And since the pandemic as well, that's extended into things like vaccines uh, and PPE. So Indonesia has been buying a lot of vaccines from, from China um, and the relationship has got closer and closer, but I think there's probably a limit to it. Indonesia wants to keep a balance. It doesn't want to become too reliant on China. And while we see that economic relationship growing, the security relationship with Australia, with the US and to a lesser extent with the UK uh, remains really, really close. So the Indonesian military uh, does a lot of training exercises with, with the US, with Australia and other Western nations that they would never consider doing with the People's Liberation Army of China because that trust simply isn't there. So I still think there's broadly a desire to have balance and to stay out of too much trouble. But there is a concern from some that Indonesia is sort of following this path dependency with China because it's becoming more and more integrated. And I guess that's a concern more broadly across Southeast Asia, where, you know, for most countries, China is their biggest source of trade and biggest future source of, of investment as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Ben. And then you mentioned uh, vaccinations and uh, Chinese results in that. And that leads on to a question we need to put to you. I'm not sure the answer is an easy one. Um, what are we actually seeing in real terms, in terms of the spread of COVID in Indonesia? Because the figures are, uh, well, it depends who you talk to. The Indonesian government claim their figures are good. Uh, others say that, that they are hiding more than they're revealing. And a link with the Chinese vaccines has certainly been established. Is that something that could get uh, uh, the majority of, of Indonesians, adult Indonesians, vaccinated quickly? Or is the whole question of COVID so big in a country with that size of population and with a fairly, um, at the basic level quite good, but not terribly sophisticated public health system when you go out into the provinces and into the rural areas? Is it something that they're just going to cross the fingers and, and hope for the best and hope that they get through it a bit better than some other places? Or will China rescue them on that? COVID has been a really difficult crisis for, for Jacob. I mean, COVID has been a test of all our, our leaders and our systems, and, and many have been found wanting. I mean, obviously, uh, Australia seems to have done okay in the first phase, but it's now locked itself off from the world. Uh, Britain and much of Europe and the US did very badly initially, but better on, on vaccine rollouts, of course. I think it's exposed Indonesia's weaknesses and Jokowi's weaknesses, just like it, in many other countries. 
I mean, officially, Indonesia's had something like 50,000 deaths so far, um, but they have one of the world's lowest testing rates. So almost certainly the real spread of the pandemic is significantly worse, but it doesn't seem yet to have been as disastrous as it has been in, in India, another very large and, and complex uh, country not too far away. Um, but I think Jokowi's approach so far has just been, been messy. Uh, his, his public communication, he's been all over the place, uh, sometimes saying, you know, ignore the virus, just get on with life. Other times saying, we have to take this seriously. He's been really reluctant to bring in any sort of lockdowns because I think he feels that most Indonesians don't have office jobs. They can't work from home. They work informally as, as drivers, as domestic helpers, as day laborers. So if there were lockdowns, those people's livelihoods would really suffer. But the, the flip side is you can't really have an economic recovery while the pandemic is still uh, virulent and spreading at the same time. So I think it's been messy, um, but I guess that's not massively surprising um, given the state of the Indonesian healthcare system and, and the challenges Indonesia faces in terms of decentralization and aligning policy across uh, this large and diverse country. Jokowi is basically betting on the vaccine uh, to be the only solution. Uh, and they have you know, bought a fair number of Chinese vaccines in the early phase. The problem is now so many other countries are vaccinating at the same time. Supply is a real issue. And if we're looking out beyond you know, this year to, to next year, we're probably going to need some sort of booster shots before too long. And the challenge for Indonesia will be, will they even be able to vaccinate people the first time around? before there's a kind of another run on vaccines for boosters. So I think it's gonna be really, really difficult for Indonesia. And the risk is that you have some sort of, you know, COVID spreading in, in the background across different parts of the archipelago for years to come. And the difficulties that will bring in terms of not just health and the economy, but how can Indonesia plug back in uh, to the regional economy? How can it open up tourism again? So I think it's gonna be quite difficult. They do have some ambitions to become a a bit of a, a base for producing the Chinese and potentially other vaccines, and that would obviously help. Um, but there are obviously questions about the efficacy of some of the Chinese vaccines. But I think we're still in the early days of the, the pandemic in many senses for a lot of our countries, and there's a lot of uncertainty to come. But it's going to be a challenge, and it's obviously very unfortunate for Jokowi that you know, he had grand plans for his, his second term. And and this is really likely in the end to dominate not just you know last year and this year, but probably next year and, and maybe even the year after that. Thank you. Um, uh, my last main question, because I imagine Michael wants to um, uh, wants us to give a bit of time for uh, any questions that the people are posting through to him. Uh, but my last question is fairly broad question. It's about the attitude approach policies of Western governments. You're sitting in Australia. Perhaps you have a reflection on the Australian. Uh, attitude towards Indonesia, which has always been a very interesting relationship. I used to say to my Indonesian diplomat friends that the most much challenging job that any di Indonesian diplomat could be given would, was ambassador to Australia, because the two political cultures are so very different. And uh, you, you read uh, often in Australia, uh, policy seems to be decided by the Sydney Morning Herald uh, and, and first read about that, whereas in Indonesia, quite the opposite was the case. But anyway, the Australian attitude and approach to Indonesia is interesting and has Australia has put in huge resources into that country into trying to understand it better and, and link with it. Or, you know, where we sit here in the UK, I no longer have a link to the British government, but I did for 35 years or, or more. And my job was in looking at a country, whether it was Indonesia or elsewhere, I was to think, are we getting it right? Is we be at that time for me being the British government? Um, are there things that you can think of um, that where, uh, say the British, say the Australian, say other Western uh, governments are getting right or getting wrong that are particularly stand out for you at all? Well, yeah, there's, there's a lot of work in, in Australia that has gone in over many years into understanding Indonesia. And that's, I guess, why I'm in Australia and not working in, in my home city of London, because it's simply further away and less interest and, and less, less resources. Um, I, I think that the biggest thing that people get wrong about Indonesia, and I would say this is governments, but also analysts and, and journalists, and I'm sure I've been guilty of this, this myself um, in different guises, it's just, it's just in a way having unrealistic expectations for Indonesia and not understanding these deep historical tensions and, and contradictions. So you tend to find in, in the discourse about Indonesia in the West, either it's going to be kind of the next democratic success story, a beacon 
for for Islamic democracies and Islamic you know, economic progress, or it's going to be the next balkanized state falling apart with the fundamentalists taking over. So people have these very extreme views and flip from one side to the other. And I think they just miss the, the contradictions of society and these deep tensions in Indonesia, which are nothing new between you know, economic openness and, and protectionism, between uh, kind of a tolerant culture and kind of more rigid, radical uh, views of, of, of Islam, um, and between kind of the perception that Indonesia should be this more active player in the world and the sense that it's an inward looking archipelago. So I guess my book is a bit of a plea to have some understanding of the many growing pains that Indonesia has been through and to say, rather than talk Indonesia up or talk it down, you'll probably get more out of it if you understand the complexities and the reasons why things can sometimes seem contradictory. And that's obviously difficult for people who are busy, who, who want a kind of three minute readout uh, in a news article or briefing notes from a minister or a visiting diplomat. It's difficult uh, to have that view. And maybe that's a difficult story to sell for, for journalists too. Uh, or for analysts, but I think that's that's the challenge. And I think the other thing is is really not to let this sort of new talk of a cold war with China, or ideological confrontation with China, push back against China, which we heard a lot about at the G7 uh, in the last few days, to not let that dominate the relationships with Indonesia or other uh, important powers in Southeast Asia, because I think in a way, the more you frame your engagement with Indonesia or Malaysia or Vietnam through that China lens, the less you'll get out of it. And if your job is to bring these countries more on side and to deepen your connections, you need to kind of listen to what they want. What do they need in terms of you know, help developing their economies in terms of trade and investment? What do they need in terms of cooperation on climate change? And it, it really appeals to, to listen to what they need and to help them deal with their kind of day to day problems. That's the best way to get them on side strategically, rather than going to them to talk about how can we push back against China or lobbying them not to use Huawei technology or whatever it may be. So I think you've got to focus on kind of the specifics and engaging with those countries and listening and understanding their needs, rather than framing everything through this kind of grand strategic uh, lens of, of competition between great powers, which at the end of the day um, is not a very convincing argument for countries like Indonesia who, you know, they want, they want relationships with America, with Australia, with the UK, they want balance in their region, but they also have to live with China as their neighbor and key economic partner at the same time. So they're not going to be choosing sides. And the more we push them to do that, the more we'll, in a way, just push them towards China. Uh, so the, the more you care about pushing back against China in a way, the less you have to talk about it with Indonesia, and the more you have to talk to them about their own domestic challenges and how we can help them overcome those. Thank you, Ben. Now, I will echo that last thought because I think trying to get Indonesia, uh, as you put it, to take sides, whether it's over China or, or another, another issue, will you'll get far less uh, from them, far less readiness to listen to you on, on other issues than you would if you just park that and say that they've got their own version. They've had a very complicated version for uh, almost the length of their time as an independent country, certainly for the last 60, 65 years with China, and they have to work that through. We have to listen to what they feel about it and agree to differ, but not to not to press or try and con convert them on that. And the other thing that strikes me is that we, uh, in the case of someone like President Jokowi, uh, it is worth the outside world listening to, is that that voice of uh, the economy accounts for more than others we need to raise the economic uh, well-being of people grassroots level with respect for their basic human rights, um, but without uh, um, pandering, if you like, to some of the human rights concerns of the West. I think this is what a number of Indonesian friends of mine would say to me if they were joining this conversation now. And I come back to uh, the, what I saw during the period of the Suharto years when I was not in Indonesia, I left Indonesia the first time just over 40 years ago when the life expectancy was about 45 and the literacy rate was about 45, 50%. And I went back 20 years later, 20 years ago now, and found that life expectancy was 60 to 65 
and literacy rates have gone up to 90%. Now that was a little bit uncomfortable for some people in the West because they, part of their mantra was a country which has, was as uh, autocratic, uh, and that's being sort of slightly kind to Suharto, autocratic certainly, and uh, corrupt as his was, couldn't possibly achieve those advances uh, at the grassroots. Well, they did. And I suspect that uh, sometimes uh, when he's down uh, looking out in the countryside, President Jokowi harks back, not wishing to emulate Suharto in, in his political sense, but uh, quite um, um, probably smiling at what Suharto achieved on, at the ground roots in economic levels. You can comment that on that or not before we turn to Michael for any questions that have come in. Well, yeah, I, th I think that's true. I mean, Jokowi certainly, you know, showed his appreciation to what, what he thinks Suharto has achieved. And certainly, I guess he wishes he had kind of the same ability to force things through. I think, I think the challenge here is just that, you know, Indonesia has, has changed and I think it's done a good job getting to where it is. The question is, what's the future for Indonesia? And I think the question there and, and the challenge there is without kind of deeper institutional reform of, of the legal system to ensure more legal certainty for Indonesians, for foreign investors, uh, to ensure kind of a more effective and responsive civil service. I think it's going to be hard for Indonesia to kind of push through the next stage of development in a, a, the very competitive and challenging world that we live in. So I, I think that's the difficulty going forward. The, the things that were good enough in the past may not necessarily be good enough in the future. Um, and it, it's really difficult for such a, a big country uh, where, you know, large parts of the country now are very wealthy, very sophisticated. There's a thriving tech sector, uh, but you still have tens of millions of Indonesians living um, very difficult lives uh, and cycling in and out of poverty. The poverty rates come down to about 10 percent, but many Indonesians are sort of in poverty one year out of the next. COVID has hit a lot of people's incomes. They probably had to spend through their savings. That will make their, their lives quite difficult. So it's really challenging. And then Indonesia is going to face a whole new series of, of problems, potentially. Obviously, we had the pandemic, but very a lot of risks from climate change to come. So the challenge is how can they push, push the state forward and development forward? And I think that does need some sort of institutional reform. And that's, I suspect, where the kind of the lack of focus on and deeper thinking on these questions uh, may become problematic unless uh, they can correct that. But they do have another presidential election coming up in, in 2024. So it's a good chance uh, for Indonesians to, to debate these issues. And you know, they will ultimately have a say in what kind of leader they want next. And interestingly, if you look back, Indonesians haven't always elected their leaders. Uh, but actually, each time the leaders have had quite different characters to, to the previous occupants of the presidential palaces. So I wonder if we'll get a different kind of flavor of person who, who's elected next time after Jokowi. And thank you very much indeed. I'm going to hand it back to Michael now. I expect he'll be thanking you properly at the end of this. Uh, of this. I've got to break off in a few minutes, uh, but let me thank you personally for what I found some fascinating, enlightening stories. And I do commend your book to, the, to people who are watching if they haven't uh, uh, taken part in this webinar, if they haven't already. It's a nice uh, read. It's, if I say it's a light read, I don't mean that in a disparaging way. It is written uh, as a good piece of FT journalism, and which is always well, well, well written and, and easy to read. Uh, and I hope you take that in the spirit. I mean it. I enjoyed reading it, and I hope others do too. Back to you, Michael. Well, thank you very much, Richard and Ben. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I'd like to uh, to pick up on on one uh, one question uh, to be, to begin with, in particular uh, about the role of Islam, because it's it's an area that you haven't touched on a great deal in 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 your discussion and I mean it's maybe a, a question to both of you uh, Richard Seabohm says uh, it, that I mean his concern uh, is that Islamists seem to control education and uh, what's the significance of that for future generations I mean first of all I suppose the question is do you think that's a fair characterization of uh, of the role of Islamism uh, in relation to education, uh, and um, where where does that go? Is that um, part of the uh, what what uh, you Ben mentioned as you know the, the the next leader being very different? Well, look, I, I think it's, it's not quite fair to say that Islamists control education. I mean, I think 
the way I see it, you have to understand that Indonesia is in quite a unique place for, for the world's biggest Muslim majority nation. And Indonesia's founding in 1945, there was a debate about whether Indonesia should have Sharia Islamic, Islamic law written into the constitution. And uh, Sukarno, the founding president, was against that. But they arrived at this quite messy, but uniquely kind of beautiful Indonesian compromise where Indonesia became a religious state with six official religions. Uh, so it's not a secular state as it's often wrongly characterized. It's religious. But Islam is officially only one of, of six religions. Uh, but it's obviously in practice, given that something like, you know, 80 plus percent of Indonesians are Muslims. It's clearly the, the dominant one. And this, it was a kind of beautiful compromise, as I said, but it's been a messy one. It's been contested ever since in a series of rebellions, uprisings, um, and just debates across Indonesian society. So I think that question isn't fully settled. And at various times, including in recent years, we've seen the question bubble up again about you know, the role for Islam in the state. But I say quite unique because we do have other Muslim majority countries that are ex explicitly secular, but most in fact have Islam in their constitution somewhere and Indonesia doesn't. Um, but is it surprising that a country that's 80% Muslim, um, you know, has a lot of sort of Muslim questions and religious questions around policymaking and the role of religion in policymaking? I think it's not that surprising. And I might compare it to the US, right? Where, um, you know, could you have a US president who is an explicit atheist? Certainly not yet. Um, so I think it's something similar in Indonesia, that these are forces that are debated in society. And there's often this fear of kind of the fundamentalists or the Islamists taking over. Um, but it never quite happens. And in the democratic era since 1998, uh, there are a number of Islamic parties in the Indonesian parliament. And their vote share has never really got much above a third. Um, although at the same time, a lot of the non-religious parties also kind of support varying degrees of bringing religion into politics so it's a complex picture but i think there's a balance there um, that's always being contested and will continue being contested for some time to come as you would expect uh, and there's certainly been a kind of rising tradition in the last 10 or 20 years of religiosity and i think that's partly a result of the freedom the greater freedom that's come since the fall of Suharto. so indonesians can express themselves now in many more ways including expressing their religiosity i think another part of it is as the country's got richer, kind of expressing your kind of success through through religious goods, if you like, through going on the pilgrimage, through kind of giving money to your mosque, uh, through being a more active part of your religious community. It's another way in which people have expressed themselves uh, economically as well. So I think it's a reflection of these broader changes and uh, it will continue to be contested, but I wouldn't be too pessimistic about the direction. I'm not sure if Richard has anything to add. Well, yes, I was going to add something, and I don't disagree with any of that. I agree with what you said there, Ben. But I was going to add, Michael, that uh, it is very dangerous in a place like Indonesia to characterize Muslim education with one brush. And just to give you three very different examples, there were closed Pesantren Muslim boarding schools in Solo, exactly where um, uh, Jokowi comes from, which unbeknown to almost anyone outside were breeding, were tut tutoring, educating people who became the Bali bombers. Uh, under the influence of a particularly hardline cleric there. And that was horrendous. They jumped over to Bali because they didn't want to kill Muslims. And when they went for Westerners, they didn't want to kill Muslims as, a, 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 as collateral damage because so, they would go to Bali and they would merely kill Hindus in their, in their very skewed version of the world. That certainly was, and I suspect is still a very small part of Muslim education, that sort of a, a hardline view. And then you come to someone like Gosdur, who we've referred to once or twice. He was very much, a, 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 and he was a truly democratic, the first democratic for 50 years, um, Indonesian president. And he was a product of the big traditional Muslim organization, Nadat al-Ulama, which has more members uh, than a sort of major trades union in Western Europe or the United States could ever dream of, uh, or any mass organization. There are more members of that than there are in the scouts or guides probably in the whole of Western Europe or, or whatever other figure you like to with, and Gustav was a product of that. He was a, a priest, a Muslim priest in that, um, in that organization. And he came to the top and he was a very important force for good and, uh, and, uh, and democracy. And I went to see uh, modern day uh, Muslim education of a very enlightened sort in the far tip of East Java, 
there are a series of secondary schools, I think it might be called Guntur, but that may not be quite the name, where a lot of um, leaders of Indonesia went, and there are three or four uh, secondary schools running uh, parallel, of all boarding schools, uh, uh, very, uh, very clearly a Muslim, and I was told the night, I went there for the night with a friend, and I was going to lecture the next morning, and I was I was ticked off just before I went to bed. I said, of course, you said, you're not allowed to lecture in Indonesian, which is what I was expecting to do. Oh, no, there are only two languages here, Arabic and English. And they were, they were producing some wonderfully well-educated people whom I don't think would frighten any horses in any town anywhere. So it is a, a very, very, if I say broad church, that's a slightly unfortunate phrase when talking about, it's a very broad mosque. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much in, <clears throat> indeed. So that, that those, those are b both very interesting contributions on on that issue. And uh, um, uh, I, I'm going to check out now. Indeed, Michael, was, thank you very much for it. Be in touch. Thanks, Richard. Thank you very okay, much. Bye bye then. Thank you. Goodbye. Um, uh, well, uh, very grateful to Richard, and um, I mean, but perhaps worth mentioning now. I mean, he uh, he was in fact ambassador in Indonesia at the time of the Bali bombing, so uh, he, he speaks with uh, direct experience of of the the impact uh, and and the cons and the limitations of uh, extreme Islamism in Indonesia. Um, I was going to move on to a question from Harold van der Linde, who uh, I know, Ben, you, you know, and uh, many in our audience will have heard a few months ago talking about Jakarta, and it's very nice to see you in the audience today, Harold. Uh, I, uh, Harold comments that Jokowi has no political party himself. He's just a, a member of the PDIP. Um, but uh, to, to what extent is he beholden to the elite, especially Megawati, and, and is that part of the tensions between expectations and, and what Jokowi can actually achieve? Well, thanks. Thanks for the question, Harold. A really good one. It, it is a curious thing because in Indonesia for a while, it seemed that, you know, every man and his dog and every woman and, and, and her dog who you know, had some political ambitions, had their own party. Uh, it was for a long while, it was quite easy to set up your own party. And, and the parties are mostly vehicles for kind of certain group interests or certain personal interests rather than for any great policy or ideal, ideological ambitions. Um, so Jokowi came along, he was in the PDIP, Megawati's party, Megawati being the former president and daughter of, of Sukarno. Um, but, and he's had a, a kind of, I guess, a kind of love-hate relationship with Megawati and she with him uh, since the early days. Um, and some people say that he's always been a puppet of Megawati, but I think it's more complex than that. I think at times Jokowi has kind of got one over Megawati. At other times, she's kind of used her power over him uh, to squeeze him, to force people into his cabinet who didn't want to be there, uh, to force certain decisions on him. So I think it's been a tug of war, if you like, ever since the early days. And we have to remember that back in 2012, when Jokowi um, ran for the governorship of Jakarta, one of the reasons he got strong support from Megawati was because she thought by tying her fortunes to this popular, potentially transformative outsider, she would boost her own prospects of running for the presidency. But in the end, Jokowi kind of pipped her to it. And she only very reluctantly agreed to nominate him as the PDIP candidate in 2014, after kind of much soul searching with her daughter, uh, Puan Maharani, who also had her own ambitions and still does uh, for the presidency. So I think it's been, it's been a push and pull, not fair to characterize him just as, as a puppet. And you know, recently in the last round of local elections, we saw Jokowi smoothing the path of his own son and son-in-law into politics as well. Um, so while he doesn't have his own party, I think that does reflect his own desire to build some sort of personal stake in politics that's beyond Megawati and, and PDIP, although his son and son-in-law were supported by PDIP as well. So I think he's trying to sort of play his own game as well to secure his, his own legacy. Uh, but, and I think this goes back to the Javanese culture, he's not the sort of guy to make a drastic move. Uh, so there was some pressure on him in 2014 to set up his own party, but he was never gonna do anything uh, so confrontational 
it's always for him about some sort of balance. Uh, but see, he certainly wants to be remembered as his own man. And I think he will be, um, because certainly if he'd listened to Megawati, he wouldn't even have been the presidential candidate. Thank you. Um, Brian Dyer um, uh, has, has asked, is the diminution of the importance of the Pancasila to the detriment of Indonesia? Um, I, I think you'd better say, for the benefit of the audience, what the Pancasila is, please, Ben, as well. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks. Thanks for the question. So pa Pancasila, as it's pronounced, is sort of the five founding principles um, espoused by, by Sukarno. Uh, which talks about things like belief in in one god not necessarily in islamic god but just one one god uh kind of belief in so social justice and other aspects um of, of indigenous society so it's quite a broad ideology i think it's quite all encompassing but i'm not sure there's really been a, a diminution of it because uh, megawati as the daughter of sakano has really viewed herself as the protector and PDIP, the party, is the protector of Sukarno's legacy. And under Jokowi's presidency, there's been a lot of push to bring Panchasila kind of more explicitly into the educational curriculum and into the public debate. Um, so I'm not sure there's been a demission. I think, if anything, it's been advanced, but it's a pretty general and broad brush kind of principles. So it doesn't really give you too much clarity. Uh, you know, people can see lots of different things into it. Um, so I think it's, it's a nice founding kind of basis, but really in many ways you can make of it what, what you will. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not sure it has been diminished. I think probably, if anything, as a slogan, it's been pushed. The challenge really is kind of to live up to those principles. How are you going to go about bringing social justice for Indonesians? It's very easy to say. And it's very difficult to do because it's about building a kind of fairer society, building a kind of system of social insurance and a healthcare system, which Jokowi has tried to do, but it's very difficult to do in practice. And I think in the end, kind of the legacy of policy reform is much more important than kind of the ideological and rhetorical commitments. And uh, finally, I mean, I've just it's got two, two, two more questions and, and then I'm, I'm going to close. Um, uh, the, um, you've talked about the importance to Jokowi of, of infrastructure, of those uh, economy building uh, measures. Christine Purdy has asked, what's the impact of modern technology uh, and social media on, on the country? I mean, th these, of course, have had huge impacts on, on all of our lives and in um, perhaps initially unexpected ways. Uh, in developing countries much more dramatically than elsewhere, al allowing countries, for example, to leapfrog over the uh, telephone landline system and, and, and things like that. W what's, the, what's the impact in Indonesia? Well, it's, yeah, it's been really dramatic. I think, yeah, we you know, would have been used to kind of this process of going from a, a, a telephone landline to having some sort of desktop to having the old dial up internet connections to, to some higher speed internet. And then obviously iPads and, and laptops and, and mobile phones. For many Indonesians, they went straight from, from nothing, from no landline, no computer, to having a mobile phone with, with access to, to the internet. Uh, there's, there's actually more mobile phone subscribers than people in Indonesia, because people have some people have quite a few different subscriptions. Have we lost you there, Ben? Uh, I'm back. I'm back. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So talking about internet connections, uh, and then mine, mine goes or, or yours goes. But anyway, a lot of Indonesians went straight straight from having no land, no landline, nothing, to having a, a mobile phone in their pocket connected to the internet. About half of Indonesians are regularly connected to the internet, and there's been a really transformative effect on in terms of social media. Uh, the way technology has changed the way people live, particularly in, in the big cities and the suburbs around the big cities. So Indonesians use platforms like Twitter, uh, Facebook more than many other countries in the world. They're very social people. And so they're very, very active on social media. And that's had good effects in terms of people connecting and some negative effects in terms of 
you know, corrosive political debates and divisions in societies and spreading of, of misinformation and the same sorts of problems we've had elsewhere, but maybe uh, more exacerbated by the rapid adoption of the technology. I guess on the positive side, we've seen a lot of Indonesian startups um, develop in the last few years, helping to tackle a lot of the infrastructure problems Indonesia has. Um, so, for example, there have been really big developments in terms of motorbike taxis uh, now connecting via app. So sort of Uber, but via motorbike in Indonesia. And some of those companies have really become multi-billion dollar success stories. Jokowi's education minister is a former uh, tech startup founder who created a company called Gojek, which does uh, basically that. It uses uh, mobile phone platforms to distribute uh, transportation services. Uh, you can order food, but even massage, any kind of service you can have delivered to, to your house now. So I think there's been really positive economic effects going um, so far. The challenge is how to make sure uh, that those platforms then kind of lead to the creation of better quality jobs for Indonesians and not just kind of insecure, uh, low wage kind of day work. So there are challenges, but there's a lot of potential um, to come because of this rapid adoption. So I think that, that there's a good story there um, and, and there's a lot of potential, but there are some pitfalls too. Thank you. And uh, just coming back uh, to, to foreign policy at, at the end for, for a moment, and um, we haven't actually uttered the words Belt and Road Initiative um, th this week, which is relatively unusual for me at the moment, uh, although you have, of course, touched on the substance of it, Chinese investment and, and, and so on. Um, uh, for a, a variety of reasons, some of them domestic and some of them uh, international. Increasingly, the British government talks about a foreign policy tilt to the Indo-Pacific, and um, uh, many will be aware we've just dispatched a, a, a naval task force uh, to, um, uh, to, to the Indo-Pacific. Um, uh, I mean, not with any military intent, mainly as a, as a, as a, a sales advertising venture, I think. But um, the, the sort of question is, I mean, first of all, um, uh, th there are a lot of questions in the UK about uh, the credibility of, of this uh, approach to foreign policy. How is it viewed, if at all, in Indonesia? Is this something that the Indonesians are aware of? Is it something that uh, will... Um, perhaps uh, trigger them in ways that you were talking about before in other words not engaging with with, with the things that matter to them but uh, uh, um, uh, trying to engage instead in uh, a, uh, a conflict with China uh, in some way what's the how is that likely to play out from an Indonesian perspective well, just briefly before I answer the UK on the Belt and Road, it's interesting because one of Xi Jinping, Chinese President Xi Jinping's founding speeches about the Belt and Road in the early days was made in the Indonesian parliament. Um, so I think China's always seen Indonesia as a really important part of the, um, the I think it's the, the Maritime Silk Road. The road is actually over water. Um, so, so Indonesia's always been a really important part of that, which is interesting. And there are some huge uh, projects in Indonesia, for example, China's first sort of effort to export its very successful domestic high-speed rail program is in Indonesia, uh, connect, which is now under construction connecting Jakarta with Bandung. So it's an interesting case study to see, see how that goes. I think when it comes to, to the UK, uh, broadly, people in Indonesia's foreign policy community would welcome uh, talk of the UK's tilt to the Indo-Pacific. I think it's just that so far, it's talk. Uh, we're yet to see any, any meat on the bones. But, but Indonesia has a good relationship with the UK. The Indonesian Prime Minister has met Dominic Raab, I think, twice in person during the pandemic, um, which, which is good. Uh, the, the climate change um, envoy was just in, in Indonesia for talks as well, Alok Sharma. Uh, so there's broadly a good relationship. There's a lot of respect for British education. Uh, there are a lot of good historic business links, the likes of HSBC and Prudential. Um, so I think that there's normally, there's by and large a good perception about the UK and, and Indonesia would welcome a more engaged uh, Britain in, in the region more generally. So I think 
Indonesia, for example, is supportive of the UK becoming an official dialogue partner of the Association of, of Southeast Asian Nations, which, which, is, which is good to see. And I think it's partly uh, because the UK hasn't been pushing as strong a line on pushing back against China as, say, the US or, or Australia. Um, it's partly because um, there's just a, a good, level, good level of respect. But I think there's also a lot of potential to deepen the relationship. I think, in a way, the UK is probably better understood in Indonesia than the other way around. Uh, Indonesian literacy in the UK is just, just really low, frankly. So I think there's a lot of opportunities on the UK side, hopefully, to deepen understanding of, of Indonesia, its potential and its challenges and, and the desire to cooperate on, on many more fronts. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to, to be done there. And I think for all countries, you know, who've noticed the UK talking about the, the tilt, the question then is, yeah, what resources beyond kind of the, the PR exercise of, of kind of naval visits, what else comes into that? Is, is the UK military going to be looking to do more uh, training and, and integration with the Indonesian military? Uh, what's the push in terms of trade and investment agreements? Uh, what's going to be the push in terms of people to people? links or educational ties so uh, it's now i think down to delivery thank you very much indeed ben i mean we we do have to end there i'm afraid and and i would like to thank ben and richard even though he's gone already for giving us such a lively discussion i mean no question in my mind that indonesia deserves more attention than it gets from us um, in passing, you said earlier, Ben, that people were busy and, uh, and, and were looking for a sort of three minute readout on Indonesia. I don't think we've provided that, but you have done a very good job of providing a 60 minute readout. And I think that um, uh, that, that merits attention. If, uh, if anyone who is watching would like to revisit any of today's event, a recording of it will be available through the RSAA YouTube channel shortly. And please, tell those people looking for a 60 minute readout. Our next event will be on the 30th of June at our normal time of 1400 when Anchal Malhotra will be talking about her study of the impact of Indian partition, family history and ethnography through the cultural artifacts of families affected. I hope that we will see you then again. And for now, thank you and goodbye. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank you.